Chapter Twenty Five, Part Two of Elsie Venner. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dion Gines, Salt Lake City, Utah. Elsie Venner by Oliver Wendell Holmes. Chapter Twenty Five: The Perilous Hour. Mr. Bernard stayed in his room a short time before setting out for his evening walk. His eye fell upon the Bible his mother had given him when he left home, and he opened it in the New Testament at a venture. It happened that the first words he read were these, Lest coming suddenly he find you sleeping. In the state of mind in which he was at the moment, the text startled him. It was like a supernatural warning. He was not going to expose himself to any particular danger this evening. A walk in a quiet village was as free from risk as Helen Darley or his own mother could ask. Yet he had an uncomfortable feeling of apprehension without any definite object. At this moment he remembered the old doctor's counsel, which he had sometimes neglected and, blushing at the feeling which led him to do it, he took the pistol his suspicious old friend had forced upon him, which he had put away loaded, and, thrusting it into his pocket, set out upon his walk. The moon was shining at intervals, for the night was partially clouded. There seemed to be nobody stirring, though his attention was unusually awake, and he could hear the whirr of the bats overhead and the pulsating croak of the frogs in the distant pools and marshes. Presently he detected the sound of hoofs at some distance, and, looking forward, saw a horseman coming in his direction. The moon was under a cloud at the moment, and he could only observe that the horse and his rider looked like a single dark object, and that they were moving along at an easy pace. Mr. Bernard was really ashamed of himself, when he found his hand on the butt of his pistol. When the horseman was within a hundred and fifty yards of him, the moon shone out suddenly and revealed each of them to the other. The rider paused for a moment, as if carefully surveying the pedestrian, then suddenly put his horse to the full gallop and dashed towards him, rising at the same instant in his stirrups and swinging something round his head what Mr. Bernard could not make out. It was a strange maneuver, so strange and threatening in aspect that the young man forgot his nervousness in an instant, cocked his pistol, and waited to see what mischief all this meant. He did not wait long. As the rider came rushing towards him, he made a rapid motion, and something leaped five and twenty feet through the air in Mr. Bernard's direction. In an instant he felt a ring, as of a rope or thong, settle upon his shoulders. There was no time to think. He would be lost in another second. He raised his pistol and fired, not at the rider, but at the horse. His aim was true. The mustang gave one bound and fell lifeless, shot through the head. The lasso was fastened to his saddle, and his last bound threw Mr. Bernard violently to the earth, where he lay motionless as if stunned. In the meantime, Dick Venner, who had been dashed down with his horse, was trying to extricate himself, one of his legs being held fast under the animal, the long spur on his boot having caught in the saddle-cloth. He found, however, that he could do nothing with his right arm, his shoulder having been in some way injured in his fall. But his southern blood was up, and as he saw Mr. Bernard move, as if he were coming to his senses, he struggled violently to free himself. "'I'll have the dog yet,' he said. "'Only let me get at him with the knife.' He had just succeeded in extricating his imprisoned leg, and was ready to spring to his feet, when he was caught firmly by the throat, and, looking up, saw a clumsy barbed weapon, commonly known as a hay-fork, within an inch of his breast. "'Hold on there! What in thunder are ye about, ye darned Portuguese?' said a voice, with a decided nasal tone in it, but sharp and resolute. 
Dick looked from the weapon to the person who held it, and saw a sturdy, plain man standing over him, with his teeth clenched, and his aspect that of one all ready for mischief. "'Lay still, now,' said Abel Stebbins, the doctor's man. "'If you don't, I'll stick ye, as sure as you're alive. I been after ye for a week, and I got ye now. I knowed I'd kitch you at some damn trick or nother, for I'd done with ye. Dick lay perfectly still, feeling that he was crippled and helpless, thinking all the time, with the Yankee half of his mind, what to do about it. He saw Mr. Bernard lift his head and look round him. He would get his senses again in a few minutes, very probably, and then he, Mr. Richard Venner, would be done for. "'Let me up! Let me up!' he cried, in a low, hurried voice. "'I'll give you a hundred dollars in gold to let me go.' the man ain't hurt don't you see him stirring he'll come to himself in two minutes let me up i'll give you a hundred and fifty dollars in gold now here on the spot and the watch out of my pocket take it yourself with your own hands i'll see ye damned first catch me lettin go was abel's emphatic answer you lay still and wait till that man comes too he kept the hay-fork ready for action at the slightest sign of resistance. Mr. Bernard, in the meantime, had been getting first his senses and then some few of his scattered wits a little together. "'What is it?' he said. "'Who's hurt? What happened?' "'Come along here as quick as you can,' Abel answered, "'and help me fix this fella. You been hurt yourself, and there's murder come purty nigh happenin'. Mr. Bernard heard the answer, but presently stared about and asked again, "'Who's hurt? What's happened?' "'You're hurt yourself, I tell ye,' said Abel. "'And there has been a murder pretty nigh.' Mr. Bernard felt something about his neck, and putting his hands up, found the loop of the lasso, which he loosened, but did not think to slip over his head in the confusion of his perceptions and thoughts. It was a wonder that it had not choked him but he had fallen forward so as to slacken it. By this time he was getting some notion of what he was about, and presently began looking round for his pistol, which had fallen. He found it lying near him, cocked it mechanically, somewhat unsteadily, towards the two men, who were keeping their position as still as if they were performing in a tableau. "'Quick now,' said Abel, who had heard the click of cocking the pistol, and saw that he held it in his hand as he came towards him. "'Give me that pistol, and you fetch that air rope layin' there. I'll have this here fella fixed in less than two minutes.' Mr. Bernard did as Abel said, stupidly and mechanically, for he was but half right as yet. Abel pointed the pistol at Dick's head. "'Now hold up your hands, you fella,' he said, "'and keep em up while this man puts the rope round your wrists.' Dick felt himself helpless, and, rather than have his disabled arm roughly dealt with, held up his hands. Mr. Bernard did as Abel said. He was in a purely passive state, and obeyed orders like a child. Abel then secured the rope in a most thorough and satisfactory complication of twists and knots. "'Now get up, will ye?' he said, and the unfortunate Dick rose to his feet. "'Who's hurt? What's happened?' asked poor Mr. Bernard again, his memory having been completely jarred out of him for the time. "'Come, look here now, you. Don't stand asking questions over and over. It beats all. Han't I told you a dozen times?' As Abel spoke, he turned and looked at Mr. Bernard. "'Hello, what in thunders? That air round your neck. Catch ye with a slipper-noose, eh? Well, if that ain't the crowner!' Hold on a minute, Cap'n, and I'll show you what that air halter's good for. Abel slipped the noose over Mr. Bernard's head and put it round the neck of the miserable Dick Venner, who made no sign of resistance. Whether on account of the pain he was in, or from mere helplessness, or because he was waiting for some unguarded moment to escape, since resistance seemed of no use. I'm going to carry you home, said Abel to the old doctor. He got a great curiosity to see ya. 
Just step along now, off that way, will ye? And I'll haul on the bridle, for fear ye she'd run away. He took hold of the leather thong, but found that it was fastened at the other end to the saddle. This was too much for Abel. Well, now, you be a pretty chap to have around a fella's neck in a slipper noose at one end of a halter, and a horse on the full spring at the other end? He looked at him from head to foot as a naturalist inspects a new specimen. His clothes had suffered in his fall, especially on the leg which had been caught under the horse. Hello, look a there now. What's that air stickin out o' your boot? It was nothing but the handle of an ugly knife, which Abel instantly relieved him of. The party now took up the line of march for old Dr. Kittredge's house, Abel carrying the pistol and knife, and Mr. Bernard walking in silence, still half stunned, holding the hay-fork, which Abel had thrust into his hand. It was all a dream to him, as yet. He remembered the horseman riding at him, and his firing the pistol, but whether he was alive, and these walls around him belonged to the village of Rockland, or whether he had passed the dark river and was in the suburb of the New Jerusalem, he could not as yet have told. They were in the street where the doctor's house was situated. "'I guess I'll fire off one of these here barrels,' said Abel. He fired. Presently there was a noise of opening windows, and the nocturnal headdresses of Rockland flowered out of them like so many developments of the night-blooming Sirius. White cotton caps and red bandana handkerchiefs were the prevailing form of efflorescence. The main point was that the village was waked up. The old doctor always waked easily from long habit, and was the first among those who looked out to see what had happened. "'Why, Abel,' he called out, "'what have you got there?' and what's all this noise about? We've catched the Portuguese, Abel answered, as laconically as the hero of Lake Erie in his famous dispatch. Go in there, you fella. The prisoner was marched into the house, and the doctor, who had bewitched his clothes upon him in a way that would have been miraculous in anybody but a physician, was down in a presentable form as soon as if it had been a child in a fit that he was sent for. "'Richard Venner!' the doctor exclaimed. "'What is the meaning of all this? "'Mr. Langdon, has anything happened to you?' "'Mr. Bernard put his hand to his head. "'My mind is confused,' he said. "'I've had a fall. "'Oh, yes, wait a minute, and it will all come back to me.' "'Sit down, sit down,' the doctor said. "'Abel will tell me about it. "'Slight concussion of the brain. "'Can't remember very well for an hour or two. We'll come right by tomorrow. Ben stunned, Abel said. He can't tell nothin. Abel then proceeded to give a Napoleonic bulletin of the recent combat of cavalry and infantry and its results, none slain, one captured. The doctor looked at the prisoner through his spectacles. What's the matter with your shoulder, Venner? Dick answered sullenly that he didn't know, fell on it when his horse came down. The doctor examined it as carefully as he could through his clothes. Out of joint. Untie his hands, Abe. By this time a small alarm had spread among the neighbors, and there was a circle around Dick, who glared about on the assembled honest people like a hawk with a broken wing. When the doctor said, Untie his hands, the circle widened perceptibly. Isn't it a little rash to give him the use of his hands? I see there's females and children standin' near. This was the remark of our dear old friend Deacon Soper, who retired from the front row as he spoke, behind a respectable-looking but somewhat hastily dressed person of the defenseless sex, the female help of a neighboring household, accompanied by a boy whose unsmoothed shock of hair looked like a last year's crow's nest but Abel untied his hands in spite of the deacon's considerate remonstrance. Now, said the doctor, the first thing is to put the joint back. Stop, said Deacon Soper, stop a minute. Don't you think it will be safer for the women folks just to wait till morning afore you put that joint into the socket? Colonel Sproul, who had been called by a special messenger, spoke up at this moment. 
let the women folks and the deacons go home if they're scared and put the fellows joint in as quick as you like i'll risk em joint in or out i want one of you to go straight down to dudley venner's with a message the doctor said i will have the young man's shoulder in quick enough don't send that message said dick in a hoarse voice do what you like with my arm but don't send that message let me go i can walk and i'll be off from this place there's nobody hurt but myself damn the shoulder let me go you shall never hear of me again mr bernard came forward my friends he said i am not injured seriously at least nobody need complain against this man if i don't the doctor will treat him like a human being at any rate and then if he will go let him there are too many witnesses against him here for him to want to stay the doctor in the meantime without saying a word to all this had got a towel round the shoulder and chest and another round the arm and had the bone replaced in a very few minutes abel put cassia into the new chase he said quietly my friends and neighbors leave this young man to me colonel sprell you're a justice of the peace said deacon soper and you know what the law says in cases like this it ain't so clear that it won't have to come afore the grand jury whether we will or no i guess we'll set that joint to-morrow morning said colonel sprell which made a laugh at the deacon's expense and virtually settled the question now trust this young man in my care said the old doctor and go home and finish your naps i knew him when he was a boy and i'll answer for it he won't trouble you any more the dudley blood makes folks proud i can tell you whatever else they are the good people so respected and believed in the doctor that they left the prisoner with him presently cassia the fast morgan mare came up to the front door with the wheels of the new light chaise flashing behind her in the moonlight the doctor drove dick forty miles at a stretch that night out of the limits of the state do you want money he said before he left him dick told him the secret of his golden belt where shall i send your trunk after you from your uncle's dick gave him a direction to a seaport town to which he himself was going to take passage for a port in south america good-bye richard said the doctor try to learn something from tonight's lesson the southern impulses in dick's wild blood overcame him and he kissed the old doctor on both cheeks crying as only the children of the sun can cry after the first hours in the dewy morning of life so dick venner disappears from this story an hour after dawn cassia pointed her fine ears homeward and struck into her square honest trot as if she had not been doing anything more than her duty during her four hours stretch of the last night abel was not in the habit of questioning the doctor's decisions it's all right he said to mr bernard the fella is squire venner's relation anyhow don't you want to wait here just a little while till i come back there's a considerable nice saddle and bridle on a dead hoss that's lying down there in the road and i guess there ain't no use in lettin on em spite so i'll just step and fetch em along i kind o calculate i won't pay to take the creature's shoes and hide off to-night and there won't be much iron on that hoss's huffs an hour after daylight i'll bet ye a quarter i'll walk along with you said mr bernard i feel as if i could get along well enough now so they set off together there was a little crowd round the dead mustang already principally consisting of neighbors who had adjourned from the doctor's house to see the scene of the late adventure in addition to these however the assembly was honored by the presence of mr principal silas peckham who had been called from his slumbers by a message that master langdon was shot through the head by a highway robber but had learned the true version of the story by this time his voice was at that moment heard above the rest sharp but thin like a bad cider vinegar i take charge of that property i say master langdon's acting under my orders and i claim that hoss and all that's on him hiram just slip off that saddle and bridle and carry em up to the institute and bring down a pair of pinchers and a file and stop 
fetch a pair of shears too there's hoss hair enough in that mane and tail to stuff a bolster with you let that hoss alone spoke up colonel sprell when a fellow goes out huntin and shoots a squirrel do you think he's going to let another fella pick him up and carry him off not if he's got a double barrel gun and the other barrel hadn't been fired off yet i should like to see the man that'll take that saddle and bridle except the one that has a fair right to the whole concern hiram was from one of the lean streaks in new hampshire and not being overfed in mr silas peckham's kitchen was somewhat wanting in stamina as well as in stomach for so doubtful an enterprise as undertaking to carry out his employer's orders in the face of the colonel's defiance just then mr bernard and abel came up together here they be said the colonel stand back gentlemen mr bernard who was pale and still a little confused but gradually becoming more like himself stood and looked in silence for a moment all his thoughts seemed to be clearing themselves in this interval he took in the whole series of incidents his own frightful risk the strange instinctive nay providential impulse which had led him so suddenly to do the one only thing which could possibly have saved him the sudden appearance of the doctor's man but for which he might yet have been lost and the discomfiture and capture of his dangerous enemy it was all past now and a feeling of pity rose in mr bernard's heart he loved that horse no doubt he said and no wonder a beautiful wild-looking creature take off those things that are on him abel and have them carried to mr dudley venner's if he does not want them you may keep them yourself for all that i have to say one thing more i hope nobody will lift his hand against this noble creature to mutilate him in any way after you have taken off the saddle and bridle abel bury him just as he is under that old beech tree will be a good place you'll see to it won't you abel abel nodded assent and mr bernard returned to the institute threw himself in his clothes on the bed and slept like one who is heavy with wine following mr bernard's wishes abel at once took off the high-peaked saddle and the richly ornamented bridle from the mustang then with the aid of two or three others he removed him to the place indicated spades and shovels were soon procured and before the moon had set the wild horse of the pampas was at rest under the turf at the wayside in the far village among the hills of new england End of chapter twenty five chapter twenty six of elsie venner this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by dion gines salt lake city utah elsie venner by oliver wendell holmes chapter twenty six the news reaches the dudley mansion early the next morning abel stebbins made his appearance at dudley venner's and requested to see the man o the house about something of consequence mr venner sent word that the messenger should wait below and presently appeared in the study where abel was making himself at home as is the wont of the republican citizen when he hides the purple of empire beneath the apron of domestic service good morning squire said abel as mr venner entered my name's stebbins and i'm stoppin for a spell with dr kittredge well stebbins said mr dudley venner have you brought any special message from the doctor you haven't heard nothin bout it squire do you mean to say said abel beginning to suspect that he was the first to bring the news of last evening's events about what asked mr venner with some interest do tell now well that beats all why that ere portugee relation of yourn is been tryin to catch a fella in a slipper noose and got catched himself that's all ye han't heard nothin about it sit down said mr dudley venner calmly and tell me all you have to say so abel sat down and gave him an account of the events of the last evening it was a strange and terrible surprise to dudley venner to find that his nephew who had been an inmate of his house 
and the companion of his daughter, was to all intents and purposes guilty of the gravest of crimes. But the first shock was no sooner over than he began to think what effect the news would have on Elsie. He imagined that there was a kind of friendly feeling between them, and he feared some crisis would be provoked in his daughter's mental condition by the discovery. He would wait, however, until she came from her chamber before disturbing her with the evil tidings. Abel did not forget his message with reference to the equipments of the dead Mustang. There was some things on the hoss, squire, that the man he catched said he didn't care no great about but perhaps you'd like to have em fetched to the mansion house if you didn't care about them though i shouldn't mind keepin em they might come handy some time or another they say hold on to anything for ten years and there'll be some kind o use for it keep everything said dudley venner i don't want to see anything belonging to that young man so abel nodded to mr venner and left the study to find some of the men about the stable to tell and talk over with them the events of the last evening he presently came upon elbridge chief of the equine department and driver of the family coach good mornin abe said elbridge what's fetched you down here so all fired early you're a damned purty lot down here you be abel answered better keep your portuguese to home next time catchin folks with slipper nooses round their necks and carryin knives in their boots what are you jawin about elbridge said looking up to see if he was in earnest and what he meant jawin about you'll find out soon as you go into that air stable of yourn ye you won't curry that here long-tailed black hoss no more and ye won't set your eyes on the fellow that rid him again in a hurry elbridge walked straight to the stable without saying a word found the door unlocked and went in the critter's gone sure enough he said glad on it the damnedest kickinest bitinest beast that ever i see or ever want to see again good riddance don't want no snappin turkles in my stable where's the man gone that brought the critter where's he gone guess you better go and ask my old man he carried him off last night and when he comes back maybe he'll tell you where he's gone to by this time elbridge had found out that abel was in earnest and had something to tell he looked at the litter in the mustang's stall then at the crib han't eat but half his feed han't been down on his straw must a been took about somewhere about ten or eleven o'clock i know that here critter's ways the fellows had him out nights afore but i never thought nothin a no mischief he is a kin of half injun what is it the chap's been a doin on tell us all about it abel sat down on a meal chest picked up a straw and put it into his mouth elbridge sat down on the other end pulled out his jackknife opened the penknife blade and began sticking it into the lid of the meal chest the doctor's man had a story to tell and he meant to get all the enjoyment out of it so he told it with every luxury of circumstance mr venner's man heard it all with open mouth no listener in the gardens of stambul could have found more rapture in a tale heard amidst the perfume of roses and the voices of birds and tinkling of fountains than elbridge in following abel's narrative as they sat there in the aromatic ammoniacal atmosphere of the stable the grinding of the horse's jaws keeping evenly on through it all with now and then the interruption of a stamping hoof and at intervals a ringing crow from the barnyard elbridge stopped a minute to think after abel had finished who's took care of them things that was on the horse he said gravely well langdon he seemed to kind of think i'd ought to have em and the squire he didn't seem to have no objection and so well i calculate i shall just hold on to them myself they ain't good for much but they're curious to keep and look at mr venner's man did not appear much gratified by this arrangement especially as he had a shrewd suspicion that some of the ornaments of the bridal were of precious metal having made occasional examinations of them with the edge of a file but he did not see exactly what to do about it except to get them from abel in the way of bargain 
"'Well, no, they ain't good for much, except to look at. "'If you ever rid on that saddle once, you would not try it again, very spry, "'not if you could help yourself.' I tried it, darn, if I sat down for the next week, eat all my victuals standin'. I should like to have them things well enough to hang up in the stable. If you want to trade some day, fetch em along down. Abel rather expected that Elbridge would have laid claim to the saddle and bridle on the strength of some promise or other presumptive title, and thought himself lucky to get off with only offering to think about trading. When Elbridge returned to the house, he found the family in a state of great excitement. Mr. Venner had told old Sophie, and she had informed the other servants. Everybody knew what had happened except Elsie. Her father had charged them all to say nothing about it to her. He would tell her when she came down. He heard her step at last, a light, gliding step, so light that her coming was often unheard except by those who perceived the faint rustle that went with it. She was paler than common this morning as she came into her father's study. After a few words of salutation, he said quietly, "'Elsie, my dear, your cousin Richard has left us.' She grew still paler as she asked, "'Is he dead?' Dudley Venner started to see the expression with which Elsie put this question. "'He is living.' but dead to us from this day forward said her father he proceeded to tell her in a general way the story he had just heard from abel there could be no doubting it he remembered him as the doctor's man and as abel had seen all with his own eyes as dick's chamber when unlocked with a spare key was found empty and his bed had not been slept in he accepted the whole account as true when he told of Dick's attempt on the young schoolmaster, "'You know Mr. Langdon very well, Elsie, a perfectly inoffensive young man, as I understand.' Elsie turned her face away and slid along by the wall to the window, which looked out on the little grass plot with the white stone standing in it. Her father could not see her face, but he knew by her movements that her dangerous mood was on her. When she heard the sequel of the story, the discomfiture and capture of Dick, she turned round for an instant, with a look of contempt and of something like triumph upon her face. Her father saw that her cousin had become odious to her. He knew well, by every change of her countenance, by her movements, by every varying curve of her graceful figure, the transitions from passion to repose, from fierce excitement to the dull languor which often succeeded her threatening paroxysms. She remained looking out at the window. A group of white fan-tailed pigeons had lighted on the green plot before it and clustered about one of their companions who lay on his back, fluttering in a strange way, with outspread wings and twitching feet. Elsie uttered a faint cry. These were her special favorites and often fed from her hand. She threw open the long window, sprang out, caught up the white fantail, and held it to her bosom. The bird stretched himself out, and then lay still, with open eyes, lifeless. She looked at him a moment, and, sliding in through the open window and through the study, sought her own apartment, where she locked herself in, and began to sob and moan like those that weep. But the gracious solace of tears seemed to be denied her, and her grief— like her anger, was a dull ache, longing, like that, to finish itself with a fierce paroxysm, but wanting its natural outlet. This seemingly trifling incident of the death of her favorite appeared to change all the current of her thought. Whether it were the sight of the dying bird, or the thought that her own agency might have been concerned in it, or some deeper grief which took this occasion to declare itself, some dark remorse or hopeless longing whatever it might be there was an unwanted tumult in her soul to whom should she go in her vague misery only to him who knows all his creatures sorrows and listens to the faintest human cry she knelt as she had been taught to kneel from her childhood and tried to pray but her thoughts refused to flow in the language of supplication she could not plead for herself as other women plead in their hours of anguish she rose like one who should stoop to drink 
and fine dust in the place of water partly from restlessness partly from an attraction she hardly avowed to herself she followed her usual habit and strolled listlessly along to the school of course everybody at the institute was full of the terrible adventure of the preceding evening mr bernard felt poorly enough but he had made it a point to show himself the next morning as if nothing had happened helen darley knew nothing of it all until she had risen when the gossipy matron of the establishment made her acquainted with all its details embellished with such additional ornamental appendages as it had caught up in transmission from lip to lip she did not love to betray her sensibilities but she was pale and tremulous and very nearly tearful when mr bernard entered the sitting-room showing on his features traces of the violent shock he had received and the heavy slumber from which he had risen with throbbing brows what the poor girl's impulse was on seeing him we need not inquire too curiously if he had been her own brother she would have kissed him and cried on his neck but something held her back there was no galvanism in kiss your brother it is copper against copper but alien bloods develop strange currents when they flow close to each other with only the films that cover lip and cheek between them mr bernard as some of us may remember violated the proprieties and laid himself open to reproach by his enterprise with a bouncing village girl to whose rosy cheek an honest smack was not probably an absolute novelty he made it all up by his discretion and good behavior now he saw by helen's moist eye and trembling lip that her woman's heart was off its guard and he knew by the infallible instinct of sex that he should be forgiven if he thanked her for her sisterly sympathies in the most natural way expressive and at the same time economical of breath and utterance he would not give a false look to their friendship by any such demonstration helen was a little older than himself but the aureole of young womanhood had not yet begun to fade from around her she was surrounded by that enchanted atmosphere into which the girl walks with dreamy eyes and out of which the woman passes with a story written on her forehead some people think very little of these refinements they have not studied magnetism and the law of the square of the distance so mr bernard thanked helen for her interest without the aid of the twenty-seventh letter of the alphabet the love labial the limping consonant which it takes two to speak plain indeed he scarcely let her say a word at first for he saw that it was hard for her to conceal her emotion no wonder he had come within a hair's breadth of losing his life and he had been a very kind friend and a very dear companion to her there were some curious spiritual experiences connected with his last evening's adventure which were working very strongly in his mind it was borne in upon him irresistibly that he had been dead since he had seen helen as dead as the son of the widow of nain before the beer was touched and he sat up and began to speak there was an interval between two conscious moments which appeared to him like a temporary annihilation and the thoughts it suggested were worrying him with strange perplexities he remembered seeing the dark figure on horseback rise in the saddle and something leap from its hand he remembered the thrill he felt as the coil settled on his shoulders and the sudden impulse which led him to fire as he did with the report of the pistol all became blank until he found himself in a strange bewildered state groping about for the weapon which he had a vague consciousness of having dropped but according to abel's account there must have been an interval of some minutes between these recollections and he could not help asking where was the mind the soul the thinking principle all this time a man is stunned by a blow with a stick on the head he becomes unconscious another man gets a harder blow on the head from a bigger stick and it kills him does he become unconscious too if so when does he come to his consciousness the man who has had a slight or moderate blow comes to himself when the immediate shock passes off and the organs begin to work again 
or when a bit of the skull is pried up if that happens to be broken suppose the blow is hard enough to spoil the brain and stop the play of the organs what happens then a british captain was struck by a cannon-ball on the head just as he was giving an order at the battle of the nile fifteen months afterwards he was trephined at greenwich hospital having been insensible all that time immediately after the operation his consciousness returned and he at once began carrying out the order he was giving when the shot struck him suppose he had never been trephined when would his consciousness have returned when his breath ceased and his heart stopped beating when mr bernard said to helen i have been dead since i saw you it startled her not a little for his expression was that of perfect good faith and she feared that his mind was disordered when he explained not as has been done just now at length but in a hurried imperfect way the meaning of his strange assertion and the fearful sadduceeisms which it had suggested to his mind she looked troubled at first and then thoughtful she did not feel able to answer all the difficulties he raised but she met them with that faith which is the strength as well as the weakness of women which makes them weak in the hands of man but strong in the presence of the unseen it is a strange experience she said but i once had something like it i fainted and lost some five or ten minutes out of my life as much as if i had been dead but when i came to myself i was the same person every way in my recollections and character so i suppose that loss of consciousness is not death and if i was born out of unconsciousness into infancy with many family traits of mind and body i can believe from my own reason even without help from revelation that i shall be born again out of the unconsciousness of death with my individual traits of mind and body if death is as it should seem to be a loss of consciousness that does not shake my faith for i have been put into a body once already to fit me for living here and i hope to be in some way fitted after this life to enjoy a better one but it is all trust in god and in his word these are enough for me i hope they are for you helen was a minister's daughter and familiar from her childhood with this class of questions especially with all the doubts and perplexities which are sure to assail every thinking child bred in any inorganic or not thoroughly vitalized faith as is too often the case with the children of professional theologians the kind of discipline they are subjected to is like that of the flathead indian papooses at five or ten or fifteen years old they put their hands up to their foreheads and ask why are they strapping down my brains in this way for so they tear off the sacred bandages of the great flathead tribe and there follows a mighty rush of blood to the long compressed region this accounts in the most lucid manner for those sudden freaks with which certain children of this class astonish their worthy parents at the period of life when they are growing fast and the frontal pressure beginning to be felt as something intolerable they tear off the holy compresses the hour for school came and they went to the great hall for study it would not have occurred to mr silas peckham to ask his assistant whether he felt well enough to attend to his duties and mr bernard chose to be at his post a little headache and confusion were all that remained of his symptoms later in the course of the forenoon elsie venner came and took her place the girls all stared at her naturally enough for it was hardly to have been expected that she would show herself after such an event in the household to which she belonged her expression was somewhat peculiar and of course was attributed to the shock her feelings had undergone on hearing of the crime attempted by her cousin and daily companion when she was looking on her book or on any indifferent object her countenance betrayed some inward disturbance which knitted her dark brows and seemed to throw a deeper shadow over her features but from time to time she would lift her eyes toward mr bernard and let them rest upon him without a thought seemingly that she herself was the subject of observation or remark then they seemed to lose their cold glitter and soften into a strange dreamy tenderness 
the deep instincts of womanhood were striving to grope their way to the surface of her being through all the alien influences which overlaid them she could be secret and cunning in working out any of her dangerous impulses but she did not know how to mask the unwanted feeling which fixed her eyes and her thoughts upon the only person who had ever reached the spring of her hidden sympathies the girls all looked at elsie whenever they could steal a glance unperceived and many of them were struck with this singular expression her features wore they had long whispered it around among each other that she had a liking for the master but there were too many of them of whom something like this could be said to make it very remarkable now however when so many little hearts were fluttering at the thought of the peril through which the handsome young master had so recently passed they were more alive than ever to the supposed relation between him and the dark schoolgirl some had supposed there was a mutual attachment between them there was a story that they were secretly betrothed in accordance with the rumour which had been current in the village at any rate some conflict was going on in that still remote clouded soul and all the girls who looked upon her face were impressed and awed as they had never been before by the shadows that passed over it one of these girls was more strongly arrested by elsie's look than the others this was a delicate pallid creature with a high forehead with wide open pupils which looked as if they could take in all the shapes that flit in what to common eyes is darkness a girl said to be clairvoyant under certain influences in the recess as it was called or interval of suspended studies in the middle of the forenoon this girl carried her autograph book for she had one of those indispensable appendages of the boarding-school miss of every degree and asked elsie to write her name in it she had an irresistible feeling that sooner or later and perhaps very soon there would attach an unusual interest to this autograph elsie took the pen and wrote in her sharp italian hand elsie venner in felic it was a remembrance doubtless of the forlorn queen of the aeneid but its coming to her thought in this way confirmed the sensitive schoolgirl in her fears for elsie and she let fall a tear upon the page before she closed it of course the keen and practised observation of helen darley could not fail to notice the change of elsie's manner and expression she had long seen that she was attracted to the young master and had thought as the old doctor did that any impression which acted upon her affections might be the means of awakening a new life in her singularly isolated nature now however the concentration of the poor girl's thoughts upon the one object which had had power to reach her deeper sensibilities was so painfully revealed in her features that helen began to fear once more lest mr bernard in escaping the treacherous violence of an assassin had been left to the equally dangerous consequences of a violent engrossing passion in the breast of a young creature whose love it would be ruined to admit and might be deadly to reject she knew her own heart too well to fear that any jealousy might mingle with her new apprehensions it was understood between bernard and helen that they were too good friends to tamper with the silences and edging proximities of love-making she knew too the simply human not masculine interest which mr bernard took in elsie he had been frank with helen and more than satisfied her that with all the pity and sympathy which overflowed his soul when he thought of the stricken girl there mingled not one drop of such love as a youth may feel for a maiden it may help the reader to gain some understanding of the anomalous nature of elsie venner if we look with helen into mr bernard's opinions and feelings with reference to her as they had shaped themselves in his consciousness at the period of which we are speaking at first he had been impressed by her wild beauty and the contrast of all her looks and ways with those of the girls around her presently a sense of some ill-defined personal element which half attracted and half repelled those who looked upon her and especially those on whom she looked 
began to make itself obvious to him, as he soon found it was painfully sensible to his more susceptible companion, the lady teacher. It was not merely in the cold light of her diamond eyes, but in all her movements, in her graceful postures as she sat, in her costume, and he sometimes thought, even in her speech, that this obscure and exceptional character betrayed itself. When Helen had said that, if they were living in times when human beings were subject to possession, she should have thought there was something not human about Elsie, it struck an unsuspected vein of thought in his own mind, which he hated to put in words, but which was continually trying to articulate itself among the dumb thoughts which lie under the perpetual stream of mental whispers. Mr. Bernard's professional training had made him slow to accept marvellous stories and many forms of superstition. Yet, as a man of science, he well knew that just on the verge of the demonstrable facts of physics and physiology there is a nebulous borderland which, what is called common sense, perhaps does wisely not to enter, but which uncommon sense or the fine apprehension of privileged intelligences may cautiously explore, and in doing so find itself behind the scenes which make up for the gazing world the show which is called nature. It was with something of this finer perception, perhaps with some degree of imaginative exaltation, that he set himself to solving the problem of Elsie's influence to attract and repel those around her. His letter, already submitted to the reader, hints in what direction his thoughts were disposed to turn. Here was a magnificent organization, superb in vigorous womanhood, with a beauty such as never comes but after generations of culture. Yet through all this rich nature there ran some alien current of influence, sinuous and dark, as when a clouded streak seems the white marble of a perfect statue. It would be needless to repeat the particular suggestions which had come into his mind, as they must probably have come into that of the reader who has noted the singularities of Elsie's tastes and personal traits the images which certain poets had dreamed of seemed to have become a reality before his own eyes then came that unexplained adventure of the mountain almost like a dream in recollection yet assuredly real in some of its main incidents with all that it revealed or hinted this girl did not fear to visit the dreaded region where danger lurked in every nook and beneath every tuft of leaves did the tenants of the fatal ledge recognize some mysterious affinity which made them tributary to the cold glitter of her diamond eyes was she from her birth one of those frightful children such as he had read about and the professor had told him of who form unnatural friendships with cold writhing ophidians there was no need of so unwelcome a thought as this she had drawn him away from the dark opening in the rock at the moment when he seemed to be threatened by one of its malignant denizens. That was all he could be sure of. The counter-fascination might have been a dream, a fancy, a coincidence. All wonderful things soon grow doubtful in our own minds, as do even common events, if great interests prove suddenly to attach to their truth or falsehood. I, who am telling of these occurrences, saw a friend in the great city, on the morning of a most memorable disaster, hours after the time when the train which carried its victims to their doom had left. I talked with him, and was for some minutes at least in his company. When I reached home, I found that the story had gone before, that he was among the lost, and I alone could contradict it to his weeping friends and relatives. I did contradict it, but alas, I began soon to doubt myself, penetrated by the contagion of their solicitude. My recollection began to question itself, the order of events became dislocated, and when I heard that he had reached home in safety, the relief was almost as great to me as to those who had expected to see their own brother's face no more. Mr. Bernard was disposed, then, not to accept the thought of any odious personal relationship of the kind which had suggested itself to him when he wrote the letter referred to. That the girl had something of the feral nature, her wild, lawless rambles in forbidden and blasted regions of the mountain at all hours, her familiarity with the lonely haunts 
where any other human foot was so rarely seen, proved clearly enough. But the more he thought of all her strange instincts and modes of being, the more he became convinced that whatever alien impulse swayed her will and modulated or diverted or displaced her affections came from some impression that reached far back into the past, before the days when the faithful old Sophie had rocked her in the cradle. He believed that she had brought her ruling tendency, whatever it was, into the world with her. When the school was over and the girls had all gone, Helen lingered in the schoolroom to speak with Mr. Bernard. "'Did you remark Elsie's ways this forenoon?' she said. "'No, not particularly. I have not noticed anything as sharply as I commonly do. My head has been a little queer, and I have been thinking over what we were talking about, and how near I came to solving the great problem which every day makes clear to such multitudes of people. What about Elsie? Bernard, her liking for you is growing into a passion. I have studied girls for a long while, and I know the difference between their passing fancies and their real emotions. I told you, you remember, that Rosa would have to leave us. We barely missed a scene, I think, if not a whole tragedy, by her going at the right moment. But Elsie is infinitely more dangerous to herself and others. Women's love is fierce enough if it once gets the mastery of them, always. But this poor girl does not know what to do with a passion. Mr. Bernard had never told Helen the story of the flower in his Virgil, or that other adventure which he would have felt awkwardly to refer to. But it had been perfectly understood between them that Elsie showed, in her own singular way, a well-marked partiality for the young master. Why don't they take her away from the school if she is in such a strange, excitable state? said Mr. Bernard. I believe they are afraid of her, Helen answered. It is just one of those cases that are ten thousand times worse than insanity. I don't think from what I hear that her father has ever given up hoping that she will outgrow her peculiarities. Oh, these peculiar children, for whom parents go on hoping every morning and despairing every night. If I could tell you half that mothers have told me, you would feel that the worst of all diseases of the moral sense and the will are those which all the bedlams turn away from their doors as not being cases of insanity. Do you think her father has treated her judiciously? said Mr. Bernard. I think, said Helen, with a little hesitation, which Mr. Bernard did not happen to notice, I think he has been very kind and indulgent, and I do not know that he could have treated her otherwise with a better chance of success. He must, of course, be fond of her, Mr. Bernard said. There is nothing else in the world for him to love. Helen dropped a book she held in her hand, and, stooping to pick it up, the blood rushed into her cheeks. It is getting late, she said. You must not stay any longer in this schoolroom. Pray, go and get a little fresh air before dinner time. End of chapter 26「Chapter 27 of Elsie Venner. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dion Gines, Salt Lake City, Utah. Elsie Venner by Oliver Wendell Holmes. Chapter 27 A Soul in Distress. The events told in the last two chapters had taken place toward the close of the week. On Saturday evening, the Reverend Chauncey Fairweather received a note which was left at his door by an unknown person who departed without saying a word. Its words were these. One who is in distress of mind requests the prayers of this congregation that God would be pleased to look in mercy upon the soul that he has afflicted. There was nothing to show from whom the note came, or the sex or age, or special source of spiritual discomfort or anxiety of the writer. The handwriting was delicate and might well be a woman's. The clergyman was not aware of any particular affliction among his parishioners which was likely to be made the subject of a request of this kind. Surely 
neither of the venners would advertise the attempted crime of their relative in this way but who else was there the more he thought about it the more it puzzled him and as he did not like to pray in the dark without knowing for whom he was praying he could think of nothing better than to step into old dr kittredge's and see what he had to say about it the old doctor was sitting alone in his study when the rev mr fairweather was ushered in he received his visitor very pleasantly expecting as a matter of course that he would begin with some new grievance dyspeptic neuralgic bronchitic or other the minister however began with questioning the old doctor about the sequel of the other night's adventure for he was already getting a little jesuitical and kept back the object of his visit until it should come up as if accidentally in the course of conversation it was a pretty bold thing to go off alone with that reprobate as you did said the minister i don't know what there was bold about it the doctor answered all he wanted was to get away he was not quite a reprobate you see he didn't like the thought of disgracing his family or facing his uncle i think he was ashamed to see his cousin too after what he had done did he talk with you on the way not much for half an hour or so he didn't speak a word then he asked where i was driving him i told him and he seemed to be surprised into a sort of grateful feeling bad enough no doubt but might be worse has some humanity left in him yet let him go god can judge him i can't you are too charitable doctor the minister said i condemn him just as if he had carried out his project which they say was to make it appear as if the schoolmaster had committed suicide that's what people think the rope found by him was for he has saved his neck but his soul is a lost one i am afraid beyond question i can't judge men's souls the doctor said i can judge their acts and hold them responsible for those but i don't know much about their souls if you or i had found our soul in a half-breed body and been turned loose to run among the indians we might have been playing just such tricks as this fellow has been trying what if you or i had inherited all the tendencies that were born with his cousin elsie oh that reminds me the minister said in a sudden way i have received a note which i am requested to read from the pulpit to-morrow i wish you would just have the kindness to look at it and see where you think it came from the doctor examined it carefully it was a woman's or girl's note he thought might come from one of the schoolgirls who was anxious about her spiritual condition handwriting was disguised looking a little like elsie venner's but not characteristic enough to make it certain it would be a new thing if she had asked public prayers for herself and a very favorable indication of a change in her singular moral nature it was just possible elsie might have sent that note nobody could foretell her actions it would be well to see the girl and find out whether any unusual impression had been produced on her mind by the recent occurrence or by any other cause the rev mr fairweather folded the note and put it into his pocket i have been a good deal exercised in my mind lately myself he said the old doctor looked at him through his spectacles and said in his usual professional tone put out your tongue the minister obeyed him in that feeble way common with persons of weak character for people differ as much in their mode of performing this trifling act as gideon's soldiers in their way of drinking at the brook the doctor took his hand and placed a finger mechanically on his wrist it is more spiritual i think than bodily said the rev mr fairweather is your appetite as good as usual the doctor asked pretty good the minister answered but my sleep my sleep doctor i am greatly troubled at night with lying awake and thinking of my future 
I am not at ease in mind. He looked round at all the doors, to be sure they were shut, and moved his chair up close to the doctor's. You do not know the mental trials I have been going through for the last few months. I think I do, the old doctor said. You want to get out of the new church into the old one, don't you? The minister blushed deeply. He thought he had been going on in a very quiet way, and that nobody suspected his secret. As the old doctor was his counsellor in sickness, and almost everybody's confidant in trouble, he had intended to impart cautiously to him some hints of the change of sentiments through which he had been passing. He was too late with his information, it appeared, and there was nothing to be done but to throw himself on the doctor's good sense and kindness, which everybody knew and get what hints he could from him as to the practical course he should pursue. He began after an awkward pause. You would not have me stay in a communion which I feel to be alien to the true church, would you? Have you stay, my friend, said the doctor, with a pleasant, friendly look. Have you stay? Not a month, nor a week, nor a day, if I could help it. You have got into the wrong pulpit, and I have known it from the first. The sooner you go where you belong, the better. And I'm very glad you don't mean to stop halfway. Don't you know you've always come to me when you've been dyspeptic, or sick anyhow, and wanted to put yourself wholly into my hands, so that I might order you, like a child, just what to do and what to take? That's exactly what you want in religion. I don't blame you for it. You never liked to take the responsibility for your own body. I don't see why you should want to have the charge of your own soul. But I'm glad you're going to the old mother of all. You wouldn't have been contented short of that. The Reverend Mr. Fairweather breathed with more freedom. The doctor saw into his soul through those awful spectacles of his, into it and beyond it, as one sees through a thin fog but it was with a real human kindness after all. He felt like a child before a strong man, but the strong man looked on him with a father's indulgence. Many and many a time when he had come desponding and bemoaning himself on account of some contemptible bodily infirmity, the old doctor had looked at him through his spectacles, listened patiently while he told his ailments, and then, in his large parental way, given him a few words of wholesome advice, and cheered him up, so that he went off with a light heart, thinking that the heaven he was so much afraid of was not so very near after all. It was the same thing now. He felt, as feeble natures always do in the presence of strong ones, overmastered, circumscribed, shut in, humbled, but yet it seemed as if the old doctor did not despise him any more for what he considered weakness of mind than he used to despise him when he complained of his nerves or his digestion. Men who see into their neighbors are very apt to be contemptuous, but men who see through them find something lying behind every human soul which it is not for them to sit in judgment on or to attempt to sneer out of the order of God's manifold universe. Little as the doctor had said out of which comfort could be extracted, his genial manner had something grateful in it. A film of gratitude came over the poor man's cloudy, uncertain eye, and a look of tremulous relief and satisfaction played about his weak mouth. He was gravitating to the majority, where he hoped to find rest. But he was dreadfully sensitive to the opinions of the minority. He was on the point of leaving. The old doctor saw plainly enough what was going on in his mind. I shan't quarrel with you, he said. You know that very well. But you mustn't quarrel with me, if I talk honestly with you. It isn't everybody that will take the trouble. You flatter yourself that you will make a good many enemies by leaving your old communion. Not so many as you think. This is the way the common sort of people will talk. You have got your ticket to the feast of life, 
as much as any other man that ever lived. Protestantism says, help yourself. Here's a clean plate and a knife and fork of your own, and plenty of fresh dishes to choose from. The old mother says, give me your ticket, my dear, and I'll feed you with my golden spoon off these beautiful old wooden trenchers, such nice bits as those good old gentlemen have left for you. There is no quarreling with a man who prefers broken victuals. That's what the rougher sort will say, and then where one scolds, ten will laugh. But, mind you, I don't either scold or laugh. I don't feel sure that you could very well have help doing what you will soon do. You know, you were never easy without some medicine to take when you felt ill in body. I'm afraid I've given you trashy stuff sometimes, just to keep you quiet. Now, let me tell you, there is just the same difference in spiritual patients that there is in bodily ones. One set believes in wholesome ways of living, and another must have a great list of specifics for all the soul's complaints. You belong with the last, and God accidentally shuffled in with the others. The minister smiled faintly, but did not reply. Of course, he considered that way of talking as the result of the doctor's professional training. It would not have been worth while to take offense at his plain speech if he had been so disposed, for he might wish to consult him the next day as to what he should take for his dyspepsia or his neuralgia. He left the doctor with a hollow feeling at the bottom of his soul, as if a good piece of his manhood had been scooped out of him. His hollow aching did not explain itself in words, but it grumbled and worried down among the unshaped thoughts which lie beneath them. He knew that he had been trying to reason himself out of his birthright of reason. He knew that the inspiration which gave him understanding was losing its throne in his intelligence, and the almighty majority vote was proclaiming itself in its stead. He knew that the great primal truths which each successive revelation only confirmed were fast becoming hidden beneath the mechanical forms of thought, which, as with all new converts, engrossed so large a share of his attention. The peace, the rest, which he had purchased, were dearly bought to one who had been trained to the arms of thought, and whose noble privilege it might have been to live in perpetual warfare for the advancing truth which the next generation will claim as the legacy of the present. The Reverend Mr. Fairweather was getting careless about his sermons. He must wait the fitting moment to declare himself, and in the meantime he was preaching to heretics. It did not matter much what he preached under such circumstances. He pulled out two old yellow sermons from a heap of such and began looking over that for the forenoon. Naturally enough, he fell asleep over it, and sleeping, he began to dream. He dreamed that he was under the high arches of an old cathedral, amidst a throng of worshippers. The light streamed in through vast windows, dark with the purple robes of royal saints, or blazing with yellow glories around the heads of earthly martyrs and heavenly messengers. The billows of the great organ roared among the clustered columns, as the sea breaks amidst the basaltic pillars which crowd the stormy cavern of the Hebrides. The voice of the alternate choirs of singing boys swung back and forward as the silver censer swung in the hands of the white-robed children. The sweet cloud of incense rose in soft fleecy mists, full of penetrating suggestions of the East and its perfumed altars. The knees of twenty generations had worn the pavement, their feet had hollowed the steps, their shoulders had smoothed the columns, dead bishops and abbots lay under the marble of the floor in their crumbled vestments, dead warriors in rusted armor were stretched beneath their sculptured effigies, and all at once all the buried multitudes who had ever worshipped there came thronging in through the aisles. They choked every space, they swarmed into all the chapels, 
they hung in clusters over the parapets of the galleries they clung to the images in every niche and still the vast throng kept flowing in and flowing in until the living were lost in the rush of the returning dead who had reclaimed their own then as his dream became more fantastic the huge cathedral itself seemed to change into the wreck of some mighty antediluvian vertebrate its flying buttresses arched round like ribs its piers shaped themselves into limbs and the sound of the organ-blast changed to the wind whistling through its thousand-jointed skeleton and presently the sound lulled and softened and softened until it was as the murmur of a distant swarm of bees a procession of monks wound along through an old street chanting as they walked in his dream he glided in among them and bore his part in the burden of their song he entered with the long train under a low arch and presently he was kneeling in a narrow cell before an image of the blessed maiden holding the divine child in her arms and his lips seemed to whisper sancta maria ora pro nobis he turned to the crucifix and prostrating himself before the spare agonizing shape of the holy sufferer fell into a long passion of tears and broken prayers he rose and flung himself worn out upon his hard pallet and seeming to slumber dreamed again within his dream once more in the vast cathedral with throngs of the living choking its aisles amidst jubilant peals from the cavernous depths of the great organ and choral melodies ringing from the fluty throats of the singing boys a day of great rejoicings for a prelate was to be consecrated and the bones of the mighty skeleton minster were shaking with anthems as if there were a life of its own within its buttressed ribs he looked down at his feet the folds of the sacred robe were flowing about him he put his hand to his head it was crowned with the holy mitre a long sigh as of perfect contentment in the consummation of all his earthly hope breathed through the dreamer's lips and shaped itself as it escaped into the blissful murmur ego sum episcopus one grinning gargoyle looked in from beneath the roof through an opening in a stained window it was the face of a mocking fiend such as the old builders loved to place under the eaves to spout the rain through their open mouths it looked at him as he sat in his mitred chair with its hideous grin growing broader and broader until it laughed out aloud such a hard stony mocking laugh that he awoke out of his second dream threw his first into his common consciousness and shivered as he turned to the two yellow sermons which he was to pick over and weed of the little thought they might contain for the next day's service the rev chauncey fairweather was too much taken up with his own bodily and spiritual condition to be deeply mindful of others he carried the note requesting the prayers of the congregation in his pocket all day and the soul in distress which a single tender petition might have soothed and perhaps have saved from despair or fatal error found no voice in the temple to plead for it before the throne of mercy End of chapter 27 within its buttressed ribs 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 chapter 28 of elsie venner this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by dion gines salt lake city utah elsie venner by oliver wendell holmes chapter twenty eight part one the secret is whispered the rev chauncey fairweather's congregation was not large but select 
the lines of social cleavage run through religious creeds as if they were of a piece with position and fortune it is expected of persons with a certain breeding in some parts of new england that they shall be either episcopalians or unitarians the mansion-house gentry of rockland were pretty fairly divided between the little chapel with the stained window and the trained rector and the meeting-house where the rev mr fairweather officiated it was in the latter that dudley venner worshipped when he attended service anywhere which depended very much on the caprice of elsie he saw plainly enough that a generous and liberally cultivated nature might find a refuge and congenial souls in either of these two persuasions but he objected to some points of the formal creed of the older church and especially to the mechanism which renders it hard to get free from its outworn and offensive formulae remembering how archbishop tillotson wished in vain that it could be well rid of the athanasian creed this and the fact that the meeting-house was nearer than the chapel determined him when the new rector who was not quite up to his mark in education was appointed to take a pew in the liberal worshippers edifice elsie was very uncertain in her feeling about going to church in summer she rather loved to stroll over the mountain on sundays there was even a story that she had one of the caves before mentioned fitted up as an oratory and that she had her own wild way of worshipping the god whom she sought in the dark chasms of the dreaded cliffs mere fables doubtless but they showed the common belief that elsie with all her strange and dangerous elements of character had yet strong religious feeling mingled with them the hymn-book which dick had found in his midnight invasion of her chamber opened to favorite hymns especially some of the methodist and quietest character many had noticed that certain tunes as sung by the choir seemed to impress her deeply and some said that at such times her whole expression would change and her stormy look would soften so as to remind them of her poor sweet mother on the sunday morning after the talk recorded in the last chapter elsie made herself ready to go to meeting she was dressed much as usual excepting that she wore a thick veil turned aside but ready to conceal her features it was natural enough that she should not wish to be looked in the face by curious persons who would be staring to see what effect the occurrence of the past week had had on her spirits her father attended her willingly and they took their seats in the pew somewhat to the surprise of many who had hardly expected to see them after so humiliating a family development as the attempted crime of their kinsmen had just been furnishing for the astonishment of the public the rev mr fairweather was now in his coldest mood he had passed through the period of feverish excitement which marks a change of religious opinion at first when he had began to doubt his own theological positions he had defended them against himself with more ingenuity and interest perhaps than he could have done against another because men rarely take the trouble to understand anybody's difficulties in a question but their own after this as he began to draw off from different points of his old belief the cautious disentangling of himself from one mesh after another gave sharpness to his intellect and the tremulous eagerness with which he seized upon the doctrine which piece by piece under various pretexts and with various disguises he was appropriating gave interest and something like passion to his words but when he had gradually accustomed his people to his new phraseology and was really adjusting his sermons and his service to disguise his thoughts he lost at once all his intellectual acuteness and all his spiritual fervor elsie sat quietly through the first part of the service which was conducted in the cold mechanical way to be expected her face was hidden by her veil 
but her father knew her state of feeling as well by her movements and attitudes as by the expression of her features the hymn had been sung the short prayer offered the bible read and the long prayer was about to begin this was the time at which the notes of any who were in affliction from loss of friends the sick who were doubtful of recovery those who had cause to be grateful for preservation of life or other signal blessing were wont to be read just then it was that dudley venner noticed that his daughter was trembling a thing so rare so unaccountable indeed under the circumstances that he watched her closely and began to fear that some nervous paroxysm or other malady might have just begun to show itself in this way upon her the minister had in his pocket two notes one in the handwriting of deacon soper was from a member of this congregation returning thanks for his preservation through a season of great peril supposed to be the exposure which he had shared with others when standing in the circle around dick venner the other was the anonymous one in a female hand which he had received the evening before he forgot them both his thoughts were altogether too much taken up with more important matters he prayed through all the frozen petitions of his expurgated form of supplication and not a single heart was soothed or lifted or reminded that its sorrows were struggling their way up to heaven born on the breath from a human soul that was warm with love the people sat down as if relieved when the dreary prayer was finished elsie alone remained standing until her father touched her then she sat down lifted her veil and looked at him with a blank sad look as if she had suffered some pain or wrong but could not give any name or expression to her vague trouble she did not tremble any longer but remained ominously still as if she had been frozen where she sat can a man love his own soul too well who on the whole constitute the nobler class of human beings those who have lived mainly to make sure of their own personal welfare in another and future condition of existence or they who have worked with all their might for their race for their country for the advancement of the kingdom of god and left all personal arrangements concerning themselves to the sole charge of him who made them and is responsible to himself for their safe-keeping is an anchorite who has worn the stone floor of his cell into basins with his knees bent in prayer more acceptable than the soldier who gives his life for the maintenance of any sacred right or truth without thinking what will specially become of him in a world where there are two or three million colonists a month from this one planet to be cared for these are grave questions which must suggest themselves to those who know that there are many profoundly selfish persons who are sincerely devout and perpetually occupied with their own future while there are others who are perfectly ready to sacrifice themselves for any worthy object in this world but are really too little occupied with their exclusive personality to think so much as many do about what is to become of them in another the rev chauncey fairweather did not most certainly belong to this latter class there are several kinds of believers whose history we find among the early converts to christianity there was the magistrate whose social position was such that he preferred a private interview in the evening with the teacher to following him with the street crowd he had seen extraordinary facts which had satisfied him that the young galilean had a divine commission but still he cross-questioned the teacher himself he was not ready to accept statements without explanation that was the right kind of man see how he stood up for the legal rights of his master when the people were for laying hands on him and again there was the government official entrusted with public money which in those days implied that he was supposed to be honest a single look of that heavenly countenance and two words of gentle command were enough for him 
Neither of these men, the early disciple nor the evangelist, seems to have been thinking primarily about his own personal safety. But now look at the poor, miserable turnkey, whose occupation shows what he was like to be, and who had just been thrusting the two respectable strangers, taken from the hands of a mob, covered with stripes and stripped of clothing, into the inner prison, and making their feet fast in the stocks. His thought, in the moment of terror, is for himself, first suicide, then what he shall do, not to save his household, not to fulfill his duty to his office, not to repair the outrage he has been committing, but to secure his own personal safety. Truly, character shows itself as much in a man's way of becoming a Christian as in any other. Elsie sat, statue-like, through the sermon. It would not be fair to the reader to give an abstract of that, when a man who has been bred to free thought and free speech suddenly finds himself stepping about, like a dancer amidst his eggs, among the old addled majority votes which he must not tread upon, he is a spectacle for men and angels. Submission to intellectual precedent and authority does very well for those who have been bred to it. We know that the underground courses of their minds are laid in the Roman cement of tradition, and that stately and splendid structures may be reared on such a foundation. But to see one laying a platform over heretical quicksands thirty or forty or fifty years deep, and then beginning to build upon it, is a sorry sight. A new convert from the Reformed to the ancient faith may be very strong in the arms but he will always have weak legs and shaky knees. He may use his hands well and hit hard with his fists, but he will never stand on his legs in the way the man does who inherits his belief. The services were over at last, and Dudley Venner and his daughter walked home together in silence. He always respected her moods and saw clearly enough that some inward trouble was weighing upon her. There was nothing to be said in such cases, for Elsie could never talk of her griefs. An hour, or a day, or a week of brooding, with perhaps a sudden flash of violence, this was the way in which the impressions which make other women weep and tell their griefs by word or letter showed their effects in her mind and acts. She wandered off up into the remoter parts of the mountain that day, after their return. No one saw just where she went. Indeed, no one knew its forest recesses and rocky fastnesses as she did. She was gone until late at night, and when old Sophie, who had watched for her, bound up her long hair for her sleep, it was damp with the cold dews. The old black woman looked at her without speaking, but questioning her with every feature as to the sorrow that was weighing on her. Suddenly she turned to old Sophie. "'You want to know what there is troubling me,' she said. "'Nobody loves me. I cannot love anybody. What is love, Sophie?' "'It's what poor old Sophie's got for her Elsie,' the old woman answered. "'Tell me, darling, don't you love somebody? Don't you love—you know? Oh, tell me, darling, don't you love to see the gentleman that keeps up at the school where you go?' They say he's the pootiest gentleman that was ever in the town here. Don't be afraid of poor old Sophie, darling. She loved a man once. See here. Oh, I've showed you this often enough. She took from her pocket a half of one of the old Spanish silver coins, such as were current in the earlier part of the century. The other half of it had been lying in the deep sea sand for more than fifty years. Elsie looked her in the face but did not answer in words. What strange intelligence was that which passed between them through the diamond eyes and the little beady black ones? What subtle intercommunication penetrating so much deeper than articulate speech? This was the nearest approach to sympathetic relations that Elsie ever had, a kind of dumb intercourse of feeling, such as one sees in the eyes of brute mothers looking on their young, but subtle as it was, it was narrow and individual, whereas an emotion which can shape itself in language 
opens the gate for itself into the great community of human affections for every word we speak is the metal of a dead thought or feeling stuck in the dye of some human experience worn smooth by innumerable contacts and always transferred warm from one to another by words we share the common consciousness of the race which has shaped itself in these symbols by music we reach those special states of consciousness which being without form cannot be shaped with the mosaics of the vocabulary the language of the eyes runs deeper into the personal nature but it is purely individual and perishes in the expression if we consider them all as growing out of the consciousness as their root language is the leaf music is the flower but when the eyes meet and search each other it is the uncovering of the blanched stem through which the whole life runs but which has never taken color or form from the sunlight for three days elsie did not return to the school much of the time she was among the woods and rocks the season was now beginning to wan and the forest to put on its autumnal glory the dreamy haze was beginning to soften the landscape and the last delicious days of the year were lending their attraction to the scenery of the mountain it was not very singular that elsie should be lingering in her old haunts from which the change of season must soon drive her but old sophy saw clearly enough that some internal conflict was going on and knew very well that it must have its own way and work itself out as it best could as much as looks could tell elsie had told her she had said in words to be sure that she could not love something warped and thwarted the emotion which would have been love in another no doubt but that such an emotion was striving with her against all malign influences which interfered with it the old woman had a perfect certainty in her own mind everybody who has observed the working of emotions in persons of various temperaments knows well enough that they have periods of incubation which differ with the individual and with the particular cause and degree of excitement yet evidently go through a strictly self-limited series of evolutions at the end of which their result an act of violence a paroxysm of tears a gradual subsidence into repose or whatever it may be declares itself like the last stage of an attack of fever and ague no one can observe children without noticing that there is a personal equation to use the astronomer's language in their tempers so that one sulks an hour over an offence which makes another a fury for five minutes and leaves him or her an angel when it is over at the end of three days elsie braided her long glossy black hair and shot a golden arrow through it she dressed herself with more than usual care and came down in the morning superb in her stormy beauty the brooding paroxysm was over or at least her passion had changed its phase her father saw it with great relief he had always many fears for her in her hours and days of gloom but for reasons before assigned had felt that she must be trusted to herself without appealing to actual restraint or any other supervision than such as old sophy could exercise without offence she went off at the accustomed hour to the school all the girls had their eyes on her none so keen as these young misses to know an inward movement by an outward sign of adornment if they have not as many signals as the ships that sail the great seas there is not an end of ribbon or a turn of a ringlet which is not a hieroglyphic with a hidden meaning to these little cruisers over the ocean of sentiment the girls all looked at elsie with a new thought for she was more sumptuously arrayed than perhaps ever before at the school and they said to themselves that she had come meaning to draw the young master's eyes upon her that was it what else could it be the beautiful cold girl with the diamond eyes meant to dazzle the handsome young gentleman he would be afraid to love her it couldn't be true that which some people had said in the village she wasn't the kind of young lady 
to make Mr. Langdon happy. Those dark people are never safe, so one of the young blondes said to herself. Elsie was not literary enough for such a scholar, so thought Miss Charlotte Ann Wood, the young poetess. She couldn't have a good temper with those scowling eyebrows. This was the opinion of several broad-faced, smiling girls, who thought each in her own snug little mental sanctum, that if, etc., etc., she could make him so happy. Elsie had none of the still, wicked light in her eyes that morning. She looked gentle but dreamy, played with her books, did not trouble herself with any of the exercises, which in itself was not very remarkable, as she was always allowed, under some pretext or other, to have her own way. The school hours were over at length. The girls went out, but she lingered to the last. She then came up to Mr. Bernard, with a book in her hand, as if to ask a question. "'Will you walk towards my home with me today?' she said, in a very low voice, little more than a whisper. Mr. Bernard was startled by the request, put in such a way. He had a presentiment of some painful scene or other, but there was nothing to be done but to assure her that it would give him great pleasure. So they walked along together on their way toward the Dudley mansion. "'I have no friend,' Elsie said all at once. "'Nothing loves me but one old woman. I cannot love anybody. They tell me there is something in my eyes that draws people to me and makes them faint. Look into them, will you?' She turned her face toward him. It was very pale, and the diamond eyes were glittering with a film, such as beneath other lids would have rounded into a tear. "'Beautiful eyes, Elsie,' he said, sometimes very piercing, but soft now, and looking as if there were something beneath them that friendship might draw out. "'I am your friend, Elsie. Tell me what I can do to render your life happier.' "'Love me,' said Elsie Venner. What shall a man do when a woman makes such a demand, involving such an avowal? It was the tenderest, cruelest, humblest moment of Mr. Bernard's life. He turned pale. He trembled almost, as if he had been a woman listening to her lover's declaration. Elsie, he said presently, I so long to be of some use to you, to have your confidence and sympathy, that I must not let you say or do anything to put us in false relations. I do love you, Elsie, as a suffering sister with sorrows of her own, as one whom I would save at the risk of my happiness and life, as one who needs a true friend more than any of all the young girls I have known. More than this you would not ask me to say. You have been through excitement and trouble lately, and it has made you feel such a need more than ever. Give me your hand, dear Elsie, and trust me that I will be as true a friend to you as if we were children of the same mother. Elsie gave him her hand mechanically. It seemed to him that a cold aura shot from it along his arm and chilled the blood running through his heart. He pressed it gently looked at her with a face full of grave kindness and sad interest, then softly relinquished it. It was all over with poor Elsie. They walked almost in silence the rest of the way. Mr. Bernard left her at the gate of the mansion house and returned with sad forebodings. Elsie went at once to her own room and did not come from it at the usual hours. At last old Sophie began to be alarmed about her, went to her apartment, and, finding the door unlocked, entered cautiously. She found Elsie lying on her bed, her brows strongly contracted, her eyes dull, her whole look that of great suffering. Her first thought was that she had been doing herself a harm by some deadly means or other. But Elsie saw her fear and reassured her. No, she said, there is nothing wrong, such as you are thinking of. I am not dying. You may send for the doctor, Perhaps he can take the pain from my head. That is all I want him to do. There is no use in the pain that I know of. If he can stop it, let him. End of chapter 28, part 1